I see a lot of familiar faces from last evening and, and many new ones as well. Thank you so much for coming out so early this morning to listen to the presentations. Um, uh, just a couple of announcements. First of all, those of you who have cell phones, uh, iPhones, electronic devices, make sure they are on silent. Uh, and because apparently they ring inside, although you have trouble calling outside anyway, so keep, keep them silent, please. Uh, the other thing is, uh, many of you here are citizens of the state of Israel. Uh, please vote. You know, take time off to do that. Uh, you are excused from your participation here to do that. Uh, I always say to people in the United States, vote early, vote often, uh, but don't break the law. Uh, I'm a lawyer, so don't break the law, whatever you do. But uh, it, it, it's fabulous to have you here. It's fabulous to be here at this time. Uh, this morning, uh, we're going to have a little bit of a change. We've been waiting for a couple of minutes here uh, because our principal speaker to start us out today is Professor Robert Wistrich. Uh, Professor Wistrich has been delayed, and so we are going to switch the order this morning, and I apologize for that. Uh, we're going to take uh, Professor Stephen Norwood first, and then Professor Wistrich will come after that in the second slot this morning. Uh, Professor Stephen Norwood, we are overjoyed to have him here. And by the way, you know, this morning, uh, you know, we have three people here that are leading experts in, in anti-Semitism, Jewish history. Uh, absolutely incredible, nobody better in the world. And in the case of Professor Stephen Norwood, uh, he received a PhD from Columbia in 1984. He is professor of history and Judaic studies at the University of Oklahoma, the author of five books, most recently, Anti-Semitism and the American Far Left, and the Third Reich in the Ivory Tower. Absolutely fascinating study, uh, which talks about how the Third Reich was viewed at Harvard. You'll be pretty shocked by the material you read there. This book was a finalist uh, for the National Jewish Book Award for Holocaust Studies. Uh, Professor Wistrich is also co-editor with uh, his spouse, Eunice Pollock, of the prize-winning two-volume Encyclopedia of American Jewish History. His articles have appeared in numerous journals, including American Jewish History, Modern Judaism, and the Journal for the Study of Anti-Semitism. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Professor Stephen Norwood. Hi, uh, let me know if you can't hear me anywhere in the auditorium. In uh, April 1933, newspapers across the United States published a photograph smuggled out of Germany that showed grinning Nazi, that showed grinning Nazi stormtroopers parading a Jew around the town of Chemnitz, Saxony in a garbage wagon. The photograph's caption stated that the stormtroopers had rounded up Chemnitz's Jews and forced them to scrub walls before jeering crowds. When one of them refused to comply with the stormtroopers' order, they placed him on exhibit in the garbage wagon. An American Jewish woman in the hamlet of Roundup, Montana, seeing the photograph and accompanying report in the Billings, Montana Gazette, immediately wrote to Montana's U.S. Senators, John Erickson and Burton Wheeler, appealing to them to ask the American government to pressure Germany to, in her words, stop these unspeakable humiliations of Jews. The Manchester Guardian and the London Jewish Chronicle, uh, both of which were available on newsstands in New York, reported the same month, it was April 1933, that in Worms, Germany, the Nazis confined Jews in a pigsty. From the beginning of Hitler's rule, Nazi annihilationist intentions toward Jews were implied by defining Jews as garbage and excrement, 
filth to be disposed of, and animals raised to be butchered. The press and radio exposed Americans in even remote locations to such images from the time the Nazis assumed power. Rabbi Max Abraham, imprisoned in the Oranienburg concentration camp in 1933, after his escape from Germany the next year, described in an account published in the United States how the SS guards impressed on Jewish inmates their worthlessness. On the first Jewish holiday after his arrival, the guards drove Rabbi Abraham and the other Jews into a manure pit and ordered him to conduct his religious service there, in the middle of the manure pit. When he refused, the guards beat him unconscious. The Oranienburg SS assigned the Jewish inmates the task of cleaning the camp latrines, work especially reserved for the Jewish Sabbath. Rabbi Abraham had to dig into the, the feces with his bare hands, as the SS denied him even a cloth. In July 1933, leading American and British newspapers reported that Nazi stormtroopers in Nuremberg had seized 260 Jewish men, ranging in age from 17 to 76, and treated them like livestock. The stormtroopers herded the Jews through Nuremberg's main streets to a field outside the city. Elderly men, unable to keep pace, were driven on by the stormtroopers' kicks. Upon arrival, many of the Jews were made to crawl about the field on their hands and knees, pulling the weeds out with their teeth, like cattle. From the beginning of Hitler's rule, the Nazis singled Jews out for especially violent treatment. German-Jewish novelist Leon Feuchtwanger, who fled to Paris after Hitler's agents invaded his home and destroyed his manuscripts, declared to the New York Times in March 1933 that the Nazis had been carrying out, quote, pogroms such as Germany has not seen since the 14th century. He stated that the atrocities of the World War paled in comparison with the accounts of German-Jewish refugees with whom he had spoken in Paris. The refugees had informed Feuchtwanger that every Jew in Germany must expect to be assaulted in the street or to be dragged out of bed and arrested to have his goods and property destroyed. Jews were targeted for special abuse in the Nazi torture cellars. British Labor Party MP Ellen Wilkinson, who traveled to Germany in 1933 to investigate Nazi persecution of Jews and political dissidents, reported that, quote, the Nazis' first attention to Jewish prisoners is to smash the nose as a symbolic act because the Nazis caricature Jews as having big noses. Wilkinson noted that the Nazis viewed the Jews as more evil than the communists. They blamed the Jews for seducing the communists from their national loyalty. From the beginning of Nazi rule, many American Jewish and non-Jewish observers expressed fear that, Nazi, that Germany's Jews would be exterminated. From the very beginning of Nazi rule, by March, 19, in March, by March 1933, the Brooklyn Jewish Examiner considered the situation so desperate that it declared that, quote, only a miracle can save the German Jews from complete annihilation. The same month, American journalist Dorothy Thompson who had made several trips to Germany immediately before and after Hitler assumed power, warned that the Nazis were carrying out a cold pogrom, that is, a program of economic strangulation designed to exterminate German Jewry within one generation. The Hitler regime was forcing Jews out of the professions, depriving Jewish youth of the opportunity for higher education by severely restricting their admission to universities, and in many sections of the country, boycotting and destroying Jewish businesses. Thompson emphasized that, quote, every Jew in Germany, all 600,000 of them, is daily humiliated and threatened with the withdrawal of his entire means of existence, unquote. She declared that the cold pogrom, quote, aims at nothing short of German Jewry's destruction. Professor Richard Gottheil of Columbia University, one of the world's leading and most eminent scholars of Semitic languages. In June 1933, similarly stressed in a newspaper interview the same month, 
that he was, quote, perfectly certain that Hitler and his band wished to exterminate the Jews in Germany. He predicted that unlike Spain, which expelled Europe's largest Jewish population in 1492, Germany would, quote, kill off the Jews by suppression of all means of livelihood so that instead of a sudden death, they shall come to their end in a lingering torture, unquote. The same month, Jacob Sonderling, one of Germany's most eminent rabbis prior to his emigration to the United States, told an audience in Boston that the Nazi called pogrom of economic strangulation, closing off of economic opportunities, and discriminatory laws was, quote, nothing short of Germany's complete, German Jewry's complete destruction. In November 1933, European journalist Pierre von Passen, whose articles appeared in many American newspapers, drawing on interviews he had conducted with Jews in three widely separated cities in Germany earlier in 1933, declared that international action was necessary to save German Jewry, quote, from physical extinction. He endorsed the call some American Jews had issued to immediately sell 150,000 Jews in Palestine. But von Passen warned that unless such a plan were carried out at once, quote, there will be no 150,000 Jews left to be settled in Palestine, unquote. While savagely persecuting Germany's Jews, the Hitler government made Jew Jewish emigration exceedingly difficult, prohibiting Jews from taking more than a small amount of funds or property out of the country. This, the Nazis believed, would ensure the liquidation of the Jewish question in Germany for all time. The Nazis were aware that it would be difficult for German Jews to establish themselves abroad, even if they managed to flee. Remember, the, the Great Depression was underway. Uh, countries outside of Germany had strict uh, immigration barriers in place and limited employment opportunities. As Alexander Brin, publisher and editor of Boston's Jewish Advocate, commented in 1933, Germany's Jews were, quote, trapped like wild beasts. During the early months of Hitler's rule, Jews in the United States and Britain, aware that German Jewry was in mortal danger, staged massive grassroots protests against Nazi anti-Semitism, which important sections of the Jewish leadership and the Roosevelt administration discouraged and attempted to contain. These demonstrations and rallies, staged in the streets, in municipal auditoriums, and in synagogues and schools, along with spontaneous boycotts of German goods and services, were shaped by rank-and-file Jewish challenges to European pogroms and to the conviction of Captain Alfred Dreyfus in France dating to the late 19th century. So there's a tremendous amount of experience here in organizing mass protests against anti-Semitism. It was the Jewish masses, not the leading Jewish organizations, who, who uh, receive almost uh, all of the attention from scholars, that took the initiative in pressing for forceful public protest against Nazi anti-Semitism. The American Jewish Committee, the AJC, representing more affluent and acculturated Jews, was deeply alarmed about Nazi intentions. But it feared that aggressive public Jewish action against Hitlerism, like street marches and organized boycotts, and even public rallies with predominantly Jewish speakers would precipitate a dangerous anti-Semitic backlash in the United States and further endanger Germany's Jews. By contrast, the American Jewish Congress, AJ Congress, was more attentive to working at lower middle class Jews of East European background and react, usually reacted favorably to grassroots protest and helped coordinate it. As early as 1932, Many American Jews at the grassroots and some Jewish newspapers were pressing for an organized worldwide boycott of German goods and services should Hitler assume power. The AJC and AJ Congress, however, both opposed the boycott. The AJ Congress finally broke with the AJC on this in August 1933 and endorsed the boycott movement long underway and uh, 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 mobilized at the grassroots all around the world, incidentally. Aware that Jews at the grassroots were inundating the White House and the U.S. State Department 
with letters and telegrams demanding a strong American diplomatic protest against Nazi anti-Semitism, the AJ Congress's National Executive Committee met on March 12, 1933 to plan a coordinated National Day of protest against the Nazis' anti-Semitic policies and atrocities. It decided to make a mass meeting in New York's Madison Square Garden a central feature of the protest. Simultaneous street parades were scheduled in 11 large American cities, and many smaller communities as well uh, were going to stage their, uh, their own protest rallies. AJ Congress President Bernard Deutsch informed the press that the National Executive Committee uh, had deliberately scheduled the, its meeting on Purim in order to uh, link Adolf Hitler with Haman, the Persian official in the Book of Hester who had attempted to exterminate the Jews. On Purim 1933, rabbis across the United States devoted their sermons to denouncing Hitler as the modern Haman. And you see this in uh, leading American Jewish newspapers. Uh, this is who's now in power. Uh, uh, on the evening of March 19th, the AJ Congress held a conference in New York, attended by 1,500 representatives of Jewish organizations, to build public support for the day of national anti-Nazi protest. Deutsch credited the Jewish masses. It's Deutsch himself who credits the masses for taking the initiative and calling for a day of protest. The AJ Congress issued the conference call, in his words, at the insistent and overwhelming demand of a practically unanimous Jewry, impatient to express its horror and indignation against Nazi anti-Semitism. Earlier that day, the AJC Executive Committee committed to quiet diplomacy and mistrustful of working class Jews of East European origin, met hoping to persuade the AJ Congress to delay action. Judge Irving Lehman did not think the AJC could succeed because, quote, the AJ Congress regards itself as the mouthpiece of the inarticulate Jewish masses of the United States and is opposed on principle to holding them back from self-expression. James Rosenberg suggested the AJC in any event issue a statement signed by members of its executive committee and other prominent persons, quote, disavowing the intemperate expressions of the masses and expressing the sober hope that the German government would deal justly with all parts of the German population, unquote. Executive Board members Rosenberg and New York Supreme Court Justice Joseph Proskauer decided to attend the AJ Congress uh, to try to prevail on it to not to hold uh, national street demonstrations. Conference delegates that evening were almost unanimous in backing coordinated national street demonstrations and rallies. The only opposition came from Proskauer and Rosenberg. George Fredman, national commander of the Jewish war veterans of the United States, proposed an organized boycott of German goods and services, which the AJ Congress leadership was still not prepared to support. American Jews had demonstrated their ability to mobilize in huge numbers against anti-Semitic atrocities in Europe during the years immediately after the World War when they staged massive grassroots street demonstrations in U.S. cities to protest the waves of pogroms in Eastern Europe. Several hundred thousand Jews in New York City took part, for example, in gigantic spontaneous parades on New York's Lower East Side on the evening of May 21st, 1919. Uh, many Jews stopped work at noon to join the demonstrations, and tens of thousands of Jewish children left their classrooms Jewish men, women, and children carrying banners in Yiddish and English paraded up and down the streets of the East Side. The parades were often led by Jewish soldiers, combat veterans of the World War. The New York Times reported that, the, quote, this big human protest occurred without advance plan or program, parades forming spontaneously everywhere. Pushcart peddlers abandoned their stands to take part. A crowd estimated over 100,000 proceeded to New York's Madison Square Garden, where a big protest uh, rally was held. Uh, obviously, most of these people couldn't get in. It was well beyond capacity. Uh, the main speaker was former U.S. Supreme Court Justice Charles Evans Hughes, who denounced the pogroms as ruthless barbarity and called on, on all Americans to join the Jews in a mighty protest. And Jews held similar parades against the East European pogroms in 1919 in May and June 1919 in Chicago, Boston, Los Angeles, and Washington. So there is a, a, a lot of experience the Jewish community has in challenging European anti-Semitism uh, at the grassroots and getting hundreds of thousands of people into the streets. And this is what's going to happen in 1933. 
Uh, and in the limited time I have, I'm just going to talk about the period from March through May, when there's this enormous outpouring of protest against Nazi anti-Semitism uh, and, and real fears expressed about the Nazis uh, 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 planning to proceed to annihilate German Jewry. Uh, uh, certainly within one generation, all of German Jewry will be gone. Uh, uh, a, a few days after uh, the March 19th conference, the Jewish war veterans, giving expression to growing grassroots Jewish militancy, demanded that President Roosevelt issue a formal protest to the Hitler government against its anti-Semitic policies and demanded that the United States immediately sever diplomatic relations and commercial relations with Germany immediately. The Jewish war veterans also announced that it would press President Roosevelt to appoint a Jew as ambassador to Germany to indicate American disgust for Nazi anti-Semitism. On March 23rd, the Jewish war veterans staged an anti-Nazi street parade in New York City to publicize these demands and call for an organized boycott of German goods and services. About 4,000 people assembled on the Lower East Side in New York and proceeded to City Hall uh, including 700 Jewish war veterans. Another 10,000 New Yorkers stood to show their support along the streets. The veterans marched in disciplined columns of four, carrying the American and Zionist flags. New York Mayor John O'Brien reviewed the parade at City Hall and announced to the war veterans that he would speak at the March 27th uh, assembly at Madison Square Garden. After the parade ended, Fredman and other Jewish war veterans leaders proceeded to the British consulate and presented an appeal to the British government to open the gates of Palestine to uh, unlimited immigration of Jews. News of the Jewish war veterans parade was transmitted to the ends of the earth by press, radio, and newsreels, informing a world audience of significant American opposition to Nazi anti-Semitism less than two months after Hitler came to power. The entire New York press and many foreign newspapers, this is carried all over Europe, uh, uh, reported on the parade. In the muscular language favored by grassroots Jewish protesters, the Jewish war veterans warned the Nazis that the march was, quote, only the opening gun in its struggle against them and emphasized that it had been, quote, a mighty salvo energized by what it had billed as its monster parade demonstration, the Jewish war veterans became the first U.S. organization to call for an organized boycott of German goods and services. The day after the parade, the Jewish war veterans sent out a thousand letters, uh, form letters to businesses across the United States asking them to boycott all German goods. It condemned as apathetic the, quote, so-called leading Jewish organizations uh, for failing to support an organized boycott. The Jewish war veterans claimed that the American Jewish Committee remained wedded to the medieval Jewish approach of, quote, cringing, begging, and praying, unquote. The AJ Congress was, quote, too old and conservative. I think, unfortunately, scholars have given almost complete emphasis to these two organizations, which are not speaking for the Jewish masses in this period and are way, way behind them. Many who enlisted in the Jewish war veterans campaign were aware that there was a precedent in the United States for a national boycott against anti-Semitism because in 1899, Jews across the United States had launched a boycott of the 1900 Paris Exposition to protest against the conviction, the, uh, the second conviction of Alfred Dreyfus at the Wren trial in, in uh, Brittany. Uh, and there is a concerted campaign to boycott French goods in protest. Of course, Dreyfus's conviction had sparked uh, savage pogroms across France and in Algeria. Mass boycott rallies were staged in New York, Chicago, and Washington, D.C., demanding a boycott of French goods. Jews in St. Louis and Kansas City took part, uh, and this received a lot of press attention. Now, the, the anti-Nazi boycott campaign launched in March 1933 alarmed the United States State Department. And there's a correspondence about, you know, how do, what do we do to, to discourage this and clamp down on it? Uh, the State Department feared offending the German government. A special agent of the State Department investigating the Jewish war veterans and trying to find out it was communist, uh, uh, communistically inclined, which was, uh, you know, as far from the truth as you could get. It, it was a militant anti-communist organization. The communists had their own veterans group, the ex-servicemen's league. Uh, 
a State Department agent investigating the Jewish war veterans reported in June 1933 that the war veterans had already written 100,000 letters to Jews throughout the United States urging them to join the boycott movement and had uh, mailed out five million boycott seals that you uh, uh, affixed to envelopes. Whenever you sent a letter, you should put the seal saying boycott German goods. And those went out all over the US. The agent was alarmed by the Jewish war veterans' plan of appealing to other American veterans' organizations to uh, pass boycott resolutions. From England, the Manchester Guardian reported that public outrage over the Nazi dictatorship's oppressive policies against Jews continued to, quote, flame high in the United States. Thousands of telegrams were pouring into President Roosevelt and members of Congress urging the United States to make an official protest uh, against Germany, uh, 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 to Germany against the Nazi persecution of Jews. Some American Jews went farther. Uh, I mean, th there are letters uh, asking uh, the U.S. to send naval warships into uh, German ports and that sort of thing. Uh, March uh, 27th, the New York Evening Post, under the headline, Jews Show United Front, stated the AJ Congress was receiving an avalanche of messages supporting the National Day of Protest from uh, Jews across the country. Rabbis were announcing a National Day of Prayer in the Yeshuv, Jews determined to fast on March 27th in sympathy with German Jewry. The French press in the days prior to March 27th gave the New York anti-Nazi protest considerable attention. Paris dailies reported that Jewish stores throughout the city would shut down at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and taxi cabs would stay off the streets between 2 and 3 p.m. to express solidarity with the rally that evening at Madison Square Garden. Jews across New York worked feverishly to mobilize for the Madison Square Garden rally. Jewish Telegraph Agency reported such passionate support in the Jewish community that it predicted a record crowd would storm the amphitheater. The Federation of Hebrew Schools of Greater New York called on all Talmud Torahs and yeshivas to stop classes at, uh, so in the afternoon so principals and teachers could speak to them about the Nazi threat to German Jewry and then have their students march to Madison Square Garden. Uh, and this is an organization with 250 affiliated schools and 60,000 pupils. Uh, and so on. Uh, the National uh, Federation of Orthodox Congregations, representing 1,000 congregations in the US, uh, endorsed the National Day of Protest. And its resolution explicitly stated that German Jewry faced annihilation, declaring, quote, we must stay the hand of destruction. Many distinguished non-Jews agreed to speak at the evening rally at the Garden. Uh, these included Al Smith, former Democratic candidate for president, former governor of New York, Senator Wagner of New York, Mayor O'Brien, American Federation of uh, Labor President William Green, uh, as well as Jewish leaders like Rabbi Wise and uh, Bernard Deutsch of the AJ Congress. Uh, Abraham Kahan was another one who, who spoke. Uh, the, the speeches from these prominent people are uh, uh, less militant than uh, what is coming up from the grassroots. Uh, they strongly condemn the Nazi leadership, but kind of bent over backwards to uh, express faith that the German people would reject this leadership. Al Smith compared the Nazis to the Ku Klux Klan, but absolved the German people from uh, what the leadership was doing, although he emphasized it was important to make an immediate stand against Nazi anti-Semitism. Christian speakers appealed to the German people to have the persecution stopped in the name of humanity and Christian principles. Uh, Bishop Dunn of the Catholic Archdiocese, in fact, withdrew from speaking on the morning of the rally in deference to State Department wishes uh, uh, the State Department claimed the, quote, mistreatment of Jews in Germany had been stopped, unquote. But uh, at the grassroots, uh, there was no stopping people from uh, expressing uh, tremendous uh, militancy uh, and commitment to uh, uh, protest against Nazi anti-Semitism and to establish an organized boycott to break diplomatic relations with Germany and so on. Uh, and we see uh, mass uh, parades in uh, heavily Jewish neighborhoods in New York like Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and Brownsville uh, in Brooklyn 
uh, where uh, there are uh, boycott placards carried uh, uh, like Sutter Avenue merchants demand boycott of German goods, that sort of thing. Um, there are uh, simultaneous uh, protests, street demonstrations, and rallies in Philadelphia uh, and in uh, Chicago and Boston. In the interest of time, I, I won't uh, go into all of these, but uh, in Chicago, for example, you get this uh, uh, auditorium packed to the top gallery with both Jewish and non-Jewish speakers denouncing, quote, the German government for its treatment of Jews and notes of sorrow, bitterness, wailing, and in a stern moral indignation that rivaled the ancient prophets, according to one press account. Thousands more, as in New York, uh, heard the speeches through loudspeakers outside, because there are way too many show, uh, people showing up at these uh, rallies uh, to get into the auditoriums. People were out in the streets. Uh, at least 35,000 in New York, for example, because the garden only held 22,000. Uh, this took place in Boston uh, as well. Uh, Faneuil Hall, the famous Cradle of Liberty, was rocked by 7,000 Jewish and non-Jewish sympathizers on April 3rd, loudly applauding speakers who denounced the uh, Germans' anti-Jewish boycott and jeering Hitler's name whenever it was mentioned. Another 3,000 people listened to speeches over amplifiers in the square outside the building. The Boston rally, interestingly, was accompanied by the hanging of effigies of Hitler in the city streets, a method of grassroots protest in Boston that dated back to the Revolutionary War era. The American Day of Protest had worldwide impact. Jews from Mexico to the Middle East publicly displayed their solidarity with it. On March 28th, the Jewish colony of Mexico City, about 2,000 Jews, staged a mass meeting to protest Nazi anti-Semitism. 25,000 Jews attended a similar meeting in Buenos Aires, Argentina. In Tunis, in North Africa, a city with uh, over one-fifth Jewish population, Jews marched in the streets against the persecution of German Jewry. And you see solidarity of North African Jews here with German Jewry. It was very striking. A French newspaper in Tunis reported on March 28th, the bad treatment meted out to Jews in Germany under the swastika has raised very intense emotions in Tunisia, unquote. It noted that, quote, for some time already, the merchants in Tunis refused to buy or sell German merchandise. This is in March already. Tunis's grand rabbi had Jewish restaurants close on March 27th in solidarity with the protests. Tunisian Jews staged smaller anti-Nazi demonstrations in Bizarre, Sousse, and other smaller towns where Jews resided. Tunis Jews conceded the wave of protests, quote, from our little Tunisia, could not by itself influence the implacable Nazis. But by joining the great movement of protests that extends from Europe to America, they would, quote, reinforce the voices from all places uh, that protest against the abuses of the Nazi regime. British working class Jews adopted a militant posture similar to that embraced by their American counterparts. Jews in London's heavily uh, working class East End spontaneously initiated a boycott of German goods and services, which was in full swing by the end of March 1933. Numerous shops displayed posters warning that German agents cannot be interviewed. There were painted and chalk pavement announcements supporting the boycott and demanding that Palestine be open for unrestricted Jewish immigration. Many Jews expressed their disappointment in what they called the milk and water attitude of the leading British Jewish organizations, most notably the Board of Deputies of British Jews, uh, which, like the AJC, was uh, calling for uh, a, a cessation of uh, street demonstrations and uh, quiet diplomacy. Uh, working class Jews in London used muscular rhetoric to promote the boycott. Soon after the Nazis came to power, uh, uh, East End shopkeepers displayed notices in their windows announcing in both Yiddish and English, Judea declares war on Germany. This is the slogan that, that, that the Board of Deputies of British Jews became horrified by.
but it's all over the East End. Judea declares war uh, on Germany, boycott German goods. Flyers announce that German goods are soaked in Jewish blood. The manager of one of the East End's largest movie theaters stated that East End Jews' militancy had caused them to cut out a section of a newsreel about Germany and Hitler, explaining it would be madness to show such a film with feeling in the East End running as high as it is. Uh, in the Whitechapel District of London, where the boycott was almost complete, the pavements were chalked with uh, the slogan, Open Palestine for Jewish Refugees and cars dashed uh, about the streets carrying boycott placards. Now, uh, the Hitler government was very concerned about this uh, and lashed out at these demonstrations even before they took place. Hermann Goering convened the foreign press corps in Berlin on March 25th to deny that the Nazis had committed any atrocities against Jews, stating, uh, to be sure, some Jewish uh, 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 stores, he said, had been shut down, uh, and in, quote, rare instances, Jews had been beaten, but these were extortionists. These were people who were bleeding the German population, and were getting their just desserts. The New York Times reported the Hitler government had concentrated its campaign of denial on the United States because uh, reports of uh, anti-Semitic atrocities in Germany were having the greatest impact in the United States. Uh, the Nazis enlisted the support of prominent German clergymen. In the interest of time, I won't uh, uh, review all of the uh, statements uh, that uh, a very prominent German clergyman issue uh, uh, to their counterparts in the United States claiming that there are no anti-Semitic atrocities being carried on in Germany. The Lutheran Bishop of Saxony, uh, Vice President of the Lutheran World Convention on March 27th, cabled the convention's president in New York asking him to, quote, take a vigorous stand against the lying propaganda against Germany. There's just a couple examples here. The president of Germany's Evangelical Church Committee appeared to Dr. Parker Cadman, a leading American clergyman, to use his influence to prevent demonstrations on the basis of false rumors, and so on. So uh, you get the Hitler government uh, calling upon uh, uh, leading clergymen to write to their American counterparts and deny that uh, there are anti-Semitic atrocities uh, taking place in Germany. But this is a clear indication that the German government is carefully monitoring the accounts of the mass demonstrations in the United States and, and it is concerned enough to have to try to issue these denials to the foreign press. Rabbi Wise, acting for the AJ Congress on April uh, 16th, 1933, pleaded with Roosevelt advisor Felix Frankfurter for some word from President Roosevelt. This is April 16th, 1933. Uh, please have President Roosevelt issue some word uh, that he was seriously concerned about the anti-Semitic persecution in Germany. But the White House would not speak out publicly. Frankfurter could only respond uh, to Wise that he believed Roosevelt would quote in his own way uh, and at the right moment give effective evidence of his concern over the occurrences in Germany unquote. Wise warned that the president's silence, his continued silence, would result in more mass street demonstrations and stimulate organized boycotts of German goods. Influential American senators might embarrass the White House by offering resolutions criticizing the president's inaction, particularly as several British members of parliament were speaking out vigorously against Nazi anti-Semitism. Frankfurter asked Roosevelt, therefore, uh, quote, for some word of progress on a plan of admission of political refugees so as to assure wise and hold off demands for congressional action, but the president did not comply. In the State Department, and I'll conclude briefly here now, uh, the State Department responded to Jewish leaders' concerns about repeated physical attacks on German Jews by downplaying American press reports of anti-Semitic violence and assuring them that the Hitler government would promptly suppress any future outbreaks. Secretary of State Cordell Hull on March 26, 1933, informed Rabbi Wise that the American Embassy in Berlin had, at his request, consulted with the principal U.S. consulates in Germany 
and, report, and, and, and had reported to him that there was nothing to worry about. The embassy report conceded that, quote, there was for a short time considerable physical mistreatment of Jews, quote, but concluded that, quote, this phase must be considered virtually terminated. Their, their line was, after all, this is what happens in revolutions. And uh, it had, was rapidly winding down or, or uh, stopping completely. Uh, and uh, this report uh, noted uh, that there had been, quote, some picketing of Jewish merchandising stores and some professional discrimination. Uh, but Hall, citing the report, emphasized that these, quote, these manifestations were viewed with serious concern by uh, the German government, which was above all interested in order and would put a stop to this sort of thing. Uh, he informed Wise that Hitler, in his capacity as leader of the Nazi party, had issued an order calling on his followers to maintain law and order and avoid disrupting trade. So there is this line in the State Department that this is moderate faction headed by Hitler that is uh, taking charge and suppressing uh, all of this, quote, disorder. All right, uh, uh, to conclude now, uh, there's another mass wave of protest in America on May 10th, 1933, uh, which uh, is to protest the mass book burnings across the Reich. This is only six weeks after the March 27th protests. Uh, and uh, in New York, 65,000 marched for six hours in the largest parade staged in the city since the armistice celebrations in 1918. Bystanders stood seven deep on the sidewalk along Fifth Avenue and Lower Broadway, and showers of ticker tape floated down from the office towers in the financial district. Spectators looked on in awe as a contingent of 2,000 rabbis marched by, a whole contingent of 2,000 rabbis, making a majestic picture with their long flowing coats, beards, and faces glistening with sorrow on the occasion. Uh, there were uh, uh, Talmud Torah students in the parade, sweatshop workers, judges who had deserted their benches. Jewish collegians chanted, two, four, six, eight, who do we assassinate? Hitler! A massive labor contingent participated, including uh, my favorite group, uh, the uh, delegates from the Undertaker's Union, uh, who marched with a, a big placard saying, we want Hitler! 50,000 marched in Philadelphia, in Chicago, 20,000 in Philadelphia, 10,000 attended a big protest meeting in Cleveland. And so uh, finally, and this is my concluding paragraph, um, th these mass grassroots protests certainly uh, received extensive press coverage around the world, uh, alerted uh, people to what might uh, quite possibly happen, uh, what, what uh, the, the, certainly the, the cold pogrom uh, was designed to annihilate German Jewry within a generation. Uh, worse could happen than that. Uh, uh, this got people to thinking about this. It also alerted the American Jewish community to, to, what, uh, the, uh, to the, the indifference that prevailed at high levels of the U.S. government that you're going to see all the way through World War II. Uh, American, I should uh, also emphasize this. Uh, it was my father who d uh, really got me interested in some of the issues uh, in, that were involved in my book, The Third Reich and the Ivory Tower. Uh, when he was about 11 years old, he watched the mass protests in Harvard Square in Boston, where the square was crammed with protesters uh, challenging Harvard's decision to warmly welcome Ernst Homstangel, Adolf Hitler's foreign press secretary, uh, to Harvard. Uh, and uh, people were out in the streets protesting this vigorously, chaining themselves to the, themselves to the fence around Harvard Square. Young men like that, aged 10 or 11, uh, who later joined the United States Armed Forces, Jewish soldiers, fought that much more vigorously when they went into combat against the Wehrmacht, and certainly made as a, a, an important contribution uh, in, the, in, in the effort uh, that crushed the Wehrmacht during World War II. This made a strong impression on a lot of people as they were growing up. There were hundreds and hundreds of thousands, in fact, millions and millions in the United States and other places in the world that were, uh, from the very moment Hitler came in, challenging Nazi anti-Semitism in a very aggressive way and going well beyond the major Jewish organizations and their demands. Uh, uh, they, they, and and uh, therefore, uh, many, many people learned what was at stake as a result of these protests. Okay.
right, I'm told we have about 15 minutes of questions. Uh, I'll, I'll okay, you, the woman in the back there, I'll start with. I'll hopefully give everyone a chance. Uh, try to, uh, the, in the interest of being fair to all the people who want to participate in this, try to limit your remarks to uh, a question uh, uh, that you know, doesn't take too long so that we can get a number of people into participation. I know it's hard to do. So. Yes. Yes, quite definitely, and the Jewish uh, organizations conducted studies. The shipping lines, the two German shipping lines, uh, were damaged economically. Uh, they depended a lot. Uh, Jews had uh, uh, traveled on German liners prior to the rise of Nazism, and uh, were uh, uh, huge numbers of them were canceling reservations and refusing to uh, book uh, passage on, on those ships. I think um, uh, in other ways uh, the studies showed that uh, the Germans uh, were taking a hit from this. Uh, it was of course extremely important in mobilizing people against the Hitler regime. It drew people together. Uh, Jewish communities across the U.S. were doing that. But in answer to your question, yes, it did make an impact uh, and both in Britain and the United States, there are careful studies conducted to assess the type of damage that it's doing. And already, in, like by mid-33, it's clear, uh, and, and uh, certainly by the end of the year when the AJ Congress swings in, the American Federation of Labor endorsed the boycott in October 1933, which was important because all its affiliated trade unions uh, really uh, started participating. The British Labor Party uh, endorses the boycott in August 1933, and that has an impact in Britain. In terms of your question about how much retaliation there is directed against German Jews, uh, and that's the kind of thing you heard from the AJC all the time, it's going to endanger German Jewry. German Jewry already was being severely persecuted, and uh, I don't know what difference uh, that sort of thing really would make. The situation was going to get increasingly worse. Yeah, in, in the corner in the back row. Uh, follow up to uh, the question is, what was the response of the German Jewish community in terms of their Jewish community? Was it similar to the response of the Soviet Jewish community that uh, was under the direct influence of the Soviet Union? Was the German Jewish community then under the influence of the uh, Nazi forces? Well, under the influence, it was frightened, and it, it was put in a, a very uh, a difficult position. And it would, it's like in any type of uh, society of this sort, these people are not able to uh, express their views freely. And so uh, they uh, often did as the government uh, asked them to do. The, the question of Jewish leadership is, uh, something that I think we have to look at very carefully. Uh, how important were these organizations? Even Leonard Dinnerstein in his book, Anti-Semitism in America, says that throughout the interwar period, even in America, the uh, Jewish organizations are rather skeletal operations that uh, have very little funding and uh, are, are not necessarily speaking for masses of Jews. That would apply in Germany, too. I can tell you that prominent Jewish members of the Reichstag, like uh, 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 my grandmother's good friend, Tony Sender, who represented the district in Frankfurt for the Social Democratic Party and was forced out of Germany almost immediately, came very close to being murdered. This is someone I would call a Jewish leader. 
came to the United States, gave, went on one of the first uh, American lecture tours to alert Americans to what was going on in Germany, and was adamant that the, that the, the boycott had to be put in place, uh, that the strongest measures had to be taken against the Hitler government, uh, and warn people of how serious the situation was. That's a Jewish leader. Uh, so uh, as far as these uh, organizations that uh, may speak for a small percentage of Jews, uh, many of them um, uh, were uh, urging uh, Jews in the West not to protest. That doesn't mean that was the, the feeling of Jews at the grassroots in Germany. Yes. Well, uh, in the case of, uh, to some degree, the, the answer is yes when you look at the AJ Congress, because it follows the masses. It reacts to what the masses are pressuring it to do, and it follows along. Wise holds off on a calling for a boycott long after Jews at the grassroots have put one in place. Months and months go by. And then finally, in August 1933, the AJ Congress endorses a boycott. That is uh, a concession that the people calling for it were right. And it was too slow to act. Deutsch, in March, in uh, setting up the March 27th Coordinated National Day of Protests, uh, concedes that uh, it is the grassroots Jews who have pushed for this and he's reacting to what they want. Uh, as far as the AJ committee, I doubt that they uh, conceded that they were wrong. They do some, they and the Board of Deputies of British Jews do some good work, particularly in terms of trying to document Nazi atrocities. The AJC put together a white book listing this, uh, coming out in May 1933, listing Nazi atrocities that have occurred in Germany. And the Board of Deputies of British Jews does the same thing in Britain. Uh, this is to circulate to the press so that they don't buy into all of these accounts coming over from uh, Germany. Remember, the, the German government mounted a massive propaganda campaign in the United States, beginning almost immediately. Adolf Hitler had been a soldier in, in World War I, and he knew that the United States intervention in World War I had helped tip the balance, had helped break the stalemate, had helped cause the German defeat. And the Nazi government was intent on keeping the United States neutral in the next world war. And so they had shortwave radio broadcasts coming into the United States. They were distributing propaganda. Uh, ships that came in from Germany were loaded with this type of propaganda. The German Navy uh, arranged with the uh, United States government uh, to uh, have these voyages of uh, battle cruisers uh, to come to American ports, to meet with German-American organizations and American municipal officials, and to show that Germany was a wonderful place with delightful and friendly uh, representatives. And the United States Navy even engages in joint military exercises with the German Navy in the middle of the 1930s. American minesweepers go out and help the uh, German battlecruiser Karlsruhe uh, take target practice. So uh, the Germans are really, really interested in swaying American opinion. And these mass protests are extremely important in getting the message across that this is a vicious anti-Semitic regime that is extremely dangerous. Okay, who's next? Okay, go ahead. I don't know if it could have been uh, influenced. This is all that uh, the American Jewish community was capable of doing. It did establish an alliance with the mainstream labor movement and got good cooperation from trade unions uh, joining in the boycott campaign and 
uh, sponsoring anti-Nazi speakers. There are several. Gerhard Zeger, who escaped from the Oranienburg concentration camp in December 1933, came to the United States to lecture extensively along with Tony Sender. They got the message across, uh, and they represented uh, the labor movements of their country, of the Social Democratic Party. Uh, Sender was Jewish and identified as such. Uh, but I don't know if the Roosevelt administration, uh, uh, I mean, what can you do beyond this? It, it was, uh, uh, there, there are uh, uh, appeasement-oriented people and anti-Semites uh, pervading the United, uh, in the United States government in high places in the State Department, uh, which has the major responsibility for foreign policy. It's been documented in the Army and Navy High Command. Uh, uh, some of the U.S. press corps did a very good job getting the message across. There are good reports coming uh, into the United States. In Britain, the Manchester Guardian is particularly good in uh, documenting Nazi uh, anti-Semitic atrocities. Uh, okay, at the end. Well, it's hard to say. This is the peak level for anti-Semitism in American history. American anti-Semitism is never more intense than during World War II. That's when you have savage beatings of Jews in streets in major American cities with the police looking on. They're called small pogroms by American Jewish organizations. You have a, a, a proliferation of anti-Semitic organizations sprouting up in the 1930s. Uh, the Coglanite movement, which is viciously anti-Semitic, and has access through the radio to millions of people listening to weekly broadcasts from Charles Coughlin. This is the filthiest, most vicious kind of racial anti-Semitism that you're going to see. And uh, he uh, circulates outright Nazi propaganda. He publishes the Protocols of the Elders of Zion in Social Justice. And this is uh, uh, circulated in front of churches in major American cities, at subway stations, and on the streets. So it, it was a period where it was more difficult, uh, you know, to operate in, in uh, 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 getting this type of message across because there were major uh, segments of American society which were going to be resistant, which were anti-Semitic. And, uh, uh, you know, in the 1960s, it was probably a somewhat uh, easier atmosphere to work in. Yeah, Rafi. Mm -hmm. Right. Addressed. This. That would have been a good idea. I, I mean, that speaks to the failure of the American Jewish leadership. The Jews at the grassroots didn't have that type of access, didn't have the opportunity to personally address Roosevelt or any of his uh, leading officials. But that, that, that is a, 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 you know, a, 
I think it's, you're strongly indicting the American Jewish leadership there. I think they failed miserably. And they had the responsibility to do this, to press the issue when they had access. Instead of tiptoeing around and always being afraid of uh, whatever backlash would result from it. Okay, in the, yeah, I'll, along, okay, go ahead. U.S. I'm not familiar. I mean, Rafi might know more about that. Uh, did you hear the question? Yeah, actually, the question I was just raising. Was okay. Like Go ahead. All right. He says the Zionist leadership in the U.S. opposed the boycott in oh in the Zionist leadership in Palestine. Yeah, not in the U.S. So, well, the U.S. It's Divided, Margotius supports the boycott. I mean, there are people that are Zionist. Yeah. Oppose the boycott. Okay. Okay, uh, I'm going to step in at this point. Uh, we're going to take about a 10